As I mentioned so very long ago, I'm in the process of setting up a new shop. It's been slow going, but I managed to snag a Rivet 60 series lathe for a really great deal. It's a very nice machine, it's very rigid, it's beautifully made, and it's extremely accurate. It was also designed to be impossible to film. The only catch is that it's a second operations lathe. Instead of having a carriage that runs along the ways for long cuts, this machine has a very well-made XY table that can be easily repositioned along the bed. I got the machine without a motor, so I added a clear path servo and rewired the headstock so the original speed control lever controls the servo speed. So far, so good. My next convenience feature is to add a power feed on the compound. This machine is very rigid and has very little run out and is just begging for the opportunity to leave a nice surface finish. Unfortunately, the responsibility for that falls to Dwell McShaky Hands, and I usually end up with a phonograph recording of uneven hand movement and swear words. If you learn how to use your own hands, you horrible piece of shit. It was the most Interestingly, some second operations lathes do actually have the option of a power feed. They use an intermediate gearbox and a series of U-joints to drive the compound screw directly. But I decided that rather than physically hurt myself with one of those, I should emotionally hurt myself with electronics and programming. Welcome to the first and possibly last project I make on Fusion 360. Yeah, it's not going to fly anyone to Mars, but we might as well go through it anyways. The design itself is fairly straightforward. The whole assembly is, at its root, a dovetail adapter to a plate with a motor on it. I decided that rather than put all my eggs in one basket, I would break this complicated component into three smaller parts. So there's a dovetail side one, the small side, a top strap, and then the other side of the dovetail actually has a block on it to hold the motor bracket. The motor bracket was designed to hold a NEMA 17 motor off to the side of the assembly and has space for two idlers to keep the... <sighs> two circles in the slot. Uh, let's see... Type 5, PI 4.5, 100 seconds, no big deal. And have space for two idlers to guide the belt. I decided not to worry too much about belt tensioning. I've designed it so the belt is pretty much tensioned right when it's installed, and from my experience in an application like this, it's not going to stretch too too much over time. If it does, I can just buy another belt. Remember this project isn't about precision motion control, it's just about getting consistent speeds. I chose an 80 tooth GT2 pulley for the lead screw and a 20 tooth GT2 pulley for the motor. This gives a 4 to 1 reduction. The reduction is really important because the stepper motor doesn't move very well at low speeds. Additionally, and probably most controversially, I didn't include any kind of disengagement mechanism for the lead screw. This means that when I turn the handle I will be turning the motor shaft as well at a 4 to 1 ratio. I'm not worried about this because even at 4 to 1 ratio it's not very fast and the driver is more than capable of handling the voltage generated. Once I've machined all the parts, I have two parts I'm going to 3D print. They're both just covers. There's one cover for the actual belts and pulleys, and then there's another cover on the back of the motor. The motor actually has drive circuitry on it, and I want to protect it from chips. I have made that mistake before. I think that covers mostly everything about the design. I'm sure other stuff will come up later, but let's start machining. The first part is going to be the part of the dovetail that attaches to the motor bracket. I designed it to be manually machinable in a vise. Yeah, I got WD-40 on the lens. 
I removed the material from the back of the part, and they lived happily ever after. There's something funny going on with the moving jaw. It seems to be dominant over the fixed jaw, like the part will always square up against the moving jaw instead of the fixed jaw. So I've started using a dowel to hold parts in place and always use the same face against the fixed jaw. It's a fairly major issue, so I've really got to figure out what's wrong, but for now that's how I've been getting around it. It's really been making chewing difficult. The fail would continue for another 10 minutes. While we watch me slowly realize the mistake I'm continuing to make, I thought I'd mention that I'm plunge milling because of the weird way I'm holding the part in the jaws. I'm only holding it on one side of the vise, which is obviously not an ideal way to hold something, especially without packing on the other side. But by plunge milling, I'm only pushing a lot of force down into the vise, so the part doesn't really have anywhere to go. Okay, we're back. There was a problem. I fixed it. It turns out what happened is that I actually cut the wrong side of this out. I was supposed to cut this out, and I cut this out. Now, you're probably thinking that's a pretty stupid mistake to make, and, well, it kind of is. But honestly, who can't say that when they start machining, they haven't accidentally turned the handle the wrong way, just for a second? That's exactly what I did, except with both handles and for a prolonged period. I've actually had this end mill for a really long time. I actually had it from back when I had my tag milling machine. It's a YG1 Alu Power. Now, I know Alu Power is a portmanteau from hell, but it really is a great end mill, especially for smaller fractional horsepower machines. Because the edges are so sharp, you can usually get away with deeper cuts, bigger step overs, higher MRR in general. You can feel like you're running a real milling machine, which is kind of nice. The only disadvantage I've found with these end mills is that the cutting edges are a little bit delicate, so they're really not forgiving for silly little mistakes. I suspect if you were running this end mill on a big rigid CNC machine with a proven program, you wouldn't have any problems at all. But if you're chewing away at a piece of aluminum in your garage like I am, you do have to be a little bit careful. Okay, if you're a purist, you're going to hate this, but hear me out. So I want this little dovetail angle thing to be normal to this face here. So I've used one of these little angle things under here and I'm using the dowel on the moving jaw trick to push this up against the fixed jaw while it's sitting in this angle. I'm hoping what that does is make this plane normal to this plane, which is what I'm mostly concerned about right now. You're also not gonna like that I'm probably just gonna eyeball the depth of this. I do have some adjustment. I just wanna make sure I get that 60 degree angle. One thing I did do is cut this shoulder here and I defined these dimensions here, so it really should just be straight across. Wish me luck. Okay, just in the middle of the cut, I'm seeing that both edges of this angle are quite parallel. So I'm reasonably confident it's doing what I want it to do. Right, that's perfect.
Okay, I think that's it. I think that looks really good. So there is this tiny little bit of a cut into there, but it actually meets up pretty consistently though. The angle looks good. I'm going to stop right there before I make it worse. So to cut this arc, I'm going to use a fly cutter and a technique I learned in a Joe Pazinski video. So basically, you indicate an edge, you move a known radius away from that edge, and then you adjust the fly cutter so it's just touching the face. That way you know exactly the radius of the fly cutter, and then you can actually move in from the side and cut the arc using an X step over. This only really works for partial arcs with a lot of space around them, but this is exactly what this is. Yeah, yeah, good thing I caught that. Okay, so the consolation prize we just about won was I was gonna use my bigger fly cutter here. The back of the tool sticks out actually a little too far. Um, so if you think about it, uh, you'd get about this deep and then you'd start hitting with the back here, so. Now I have actually set the radius to be a little bit small on this uh, because what I wanna do is put the pieces together and then do them both at the end, thus simulating that I did a good job the first time. Okay, so I think I'm going to get a beard after doing this one, a silver beard. Gorgeous. Now it goes without saying, I don't have an auto feed on this machine, but uh, might be a good future project depending on how this uh, programming turns out. One thing that actually made that whole fly cutter operation a lot easier is I gave myself this slot to run out into at the end. That also made cutting the dovetail a lot easier. This, uh, this was intentionally designed here just to give myself space for those two operations. And uh, yeah, I'd say it worked out pretty well. All right, that part came together pretty nicely. You'll notice I put some, uh, some spot drills a little off center here. That's just in case I want to try it wrong later. The second part we're going to make is very straightforward. It's just the joining piece that goes between the two halves of the dovetail. While I was filming this, I think the tripod was leaning against my leg a little bit, which was touching the base of the machine. So that's where all this vibration is coming from. The machine itself certainly doesn't vibrate like that. I'm planning on getting a new filming arm for this machine eventually, or maybe even making something. But for now, I've got to put a tripod sort of next to me. That's why my hand always goes in front of the camera every time I touch the quill. You can see the parts getting kind of hot here, which is an unfortunate side effect of conventional milling and also not having flood coolant. Rather than cutting off a hot chip and throwing it away like climb milling, conventional milling kind of leaves the heat behind as it goes, so the part overall gets hotter. It's not really a huge deal, except it makes the aluminum a little stickier and tends to stick to the cutter a little more, but we're still talking about temperatures that aren't really exceeding maybe 120 Celsius.
Two lessons I seem to insist on learning over and over again are that I can't tap perpendicular holes by hand, and I also can't seem to design something for fasteners that I actually have. I had to change these over to countersink screws while I was machining because I don't have the right length socket heads. Countersink screws are a little inferior in this application because they're semi-locating. They're going to be pulling the two dovetail sides around as they're tightened. I do have dowel holes in here, but I'm not going to ream them until the thing is finally assembled. I think I'm going to end the video here, just because it's getting pretty long. Part 2, I'm going to machine the other two parts. I'm going to show the 3D printed parts, and hopefully I'll go through the electronics and the coding. I know I have a unfortunate history with saying I'm going to show electronics in the second video, and then disappearing for two years. But this time, I got a really good feeling about it. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Cheers!